Thank you so much for coming. Um, I know there are always a lot of events during this International Women's Day week, so <laughs> we're happy that you chose us instead of whatever else is going on this morning. Um, the OES has been working quite a lot over the last few years to incorporate a gender perspective into our, our approach to what we call here multidimensional security or citizen security or public security. Um, it's been a bit of a challenge because security policies in the region still tend to focus mostly on, on public security and don't take into account the, the multiple forms of violence that women and children face in the home. In fact, the home is still the, the least safe place for women and children throughout the region, and, and we, we do need security policies to take that reality into account, in addition to all of the, the forms of violence and insecurity that women might be facing in the in the public sphere as well, and there are many. <laughs> um, so from the, the Inter-American Commission of Women, we're, the, we're also the follow-up mechanism to the um, Inter-American Convention on Violence Against Women. It has a longer name, but I won't say it. We also call it the Belém do Pará Convention. Um, and that's been one of the, the main demands, I think, of our constituents over the last few years is, is broadening the, the definition of security to take into account the the full scale of, of forms of violence that, that women face on a daily basis in, in their daily lives, in their own homes, as they walk through the streets, as they work, as they go to school, as they go to the doctors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we've been working more closely, I think, with the Department of Public Security, which is part of the Secretariat for Multidimensional Security here at the OES, and I think you're going to hear a bit more from them later. Um, so they'll, they'll talk in a little bit more detail about um, their efforts to incorporate um, gender issues into public security issues. So we, we look at mostly at the, at the violence against women angle, and they look mostly at the public security angle, and, and we have sort of an ongoing dialogue with them to make sure that um, the issue is being addressed from as comprehensive a perspective as possible. So. I'll close here. I'm happy to answer more questions later on about the, the work that we do at the Inter-American Commission of Women, but I'll, I'll hand it over to our, our more um, technical speakers, who I'm sure are going to be more interesting. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you. So again, um, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm glad to have uh, um, such, a, such a great audience. Um, and I'm extremely happy for our panelists who will uh, speak shortly. But I did want to give you a little bit of a, of a background of how this, um, this event um, came about. Basically, uh, I'm just going to start with a few points that I think is our common understanding these days about how uh, Crime and violence affects women and girls, uh, adolescent females, differently than it does to, to men uh, and boys. And I think that the fact that you have a region, in this case Latin America and the Caribbean, with high rates of prevalence of violence against women, but also social and cultural and even political norms that shape behavior uh, on a daily basis. And, um, create a context in which negative, negative acti attitudes to women arise, it's, a, it's certainly relevant for, for, for this morning discussion. Um, with that in mind, USAID, and we, I would like to give a special thanks to USAID and to the colleagues from USAID who are present today at this, at this event, because USAID, USAID um, granted funding to the OAS um, and to PADF to conduct a research, um, a research project in Latin America and the Caribbean, focusing on on three countries particularly, but with a, but, and I will get into that shortly, but also with looking at, at the region as a whole, uh, to better understand how mainstream gender uh, into citizen security programming. Uh, the research will be conducted um, by PADF, um, but local partners, the Inter-American Commission of, uh, of, of Women, and also other units that we hope to incorporate from, from the OAS as well. Just to put this into perspective, and we can certainly, the panelists will probably get into that a little bit, um, a little bit later, these are some of the um, statistics 
uh, surrounded the issue of security and, and women, gender-based violence, human trafficking, you name it. I will not get into that, into each of those, because some of you know them very well. Um, but the, I think that what, what happens, at least for me, when, you, when you're working for so many years on citizen security, sometimes um, you don't know how impactful the statistics could be when you share it with somebody who has never seen those statistics. So when, when you put into perspective somebody who is not in the field, is not a gender expert, is not a, a crime and violence prevention expert, and then you, you, know, you talk to an architect, you talk to a, a, another person, and you say these numbers is completely outrageous, it's, it's appalling. And I think that all of us should also, also keep, keep, that, um, keep that in mind. I would like to point out that even though gender-based violence and, and, those, and human trafficking and, and other elements that are extremely, extremely relevant will not be the only focus of this research. This research will also take a look at other issues. For instance, uh, how much understanding do policymakers have in terms of how women and girls are affected disproportionately by general insecurity or by security policies? How does impunity affect women's access to justice? Um, how much progress has been made in the region to mainstream, uh, uh, to mainstream um, a gender into city security programming. Certainly, it will not be a formal evaluation in the context of USAID uh, language and, and rules and regulation. It will not be an evaluation of USAID programming on citizen security in the region, but we'll try to uh, ga gather as much information as we can from citizen security implementers uh, from USAID in the, in the targeted countries. Um, issues about the consequences of, of, of uh, women in security to you know, leave the house alone, feel the need to move from neighborhood to neighborhood, or even to migrate. So as I mentioned, um, targeted countries, Mexico, El Salvador, and Honduras initially. Um, so certainly progress is happening when you look at the big picture. Um, the murder rate has been going down, down thanks to um, local efforts and also efforts, um, you know, spearheaded by, by the U.S. government through USAID, INL, and other implementers. In El Salvador, the murder rate has been dropping, and Honduras has also been, been dropping in the, last, in the last two years, three years. Um, but not, not everywhere. In the case of Mexico, uh, actually it's going in the opposite direction, unfortunately. Um, the economic costs of violence are eight times the public investment on health services. 93% um, of crimes and misdemeanors go unreported. Those are all crimes and all misdemeanors, not only of the ones affecting you know, women. When you take only women into consideration, it's even higher. Um, six out of 10 women had experienced some kind of violent incident. Um, and in Mexico, nine women were killed each day during 2018. Um, so, to address that, of course, in the last couple of years, we have seen uh, several um, efforts by the international community, most, um, mostly the, the U.S. So you, we have had, you know, Merida Initiative, CARSI, the Alliance for Prosperity, and all of them have provided significant funding to the region to address citizen, um, citizen insecurity. And I think that's also important to take into consideration because it's also not only is uh, the right thing to do, uh, focusing on mainstreaming gender into citizen security programming, but it also linked to a large investment that has been made in recent, in recent years. Um, these tables are maybe too little, of course, for, for, for you guys to take a look, but basically what these uh, tables show is that in the last you know, three years, to fiscal year 2016, 17, and 18, and a little bit of an estimate of 19, the funds um, devoted to citizen security programming have been equal or even higher than econ economic support funding in some of the targeted countries. I, so when you, there was a study done recently, well, not that recently, I want to say maybe two and a half, three years ago, and the, the researchers found more than a thousand crime and violence prevention interventions in the region. So when we're talking about mainstreaming gender into citizen security space, we're not talking about one, two, three, four large programs. We're talking about hundreds, if not thousands of programs that are done by NGOs, by local governments, by departmental governments, or by national governments, 
work done by multilateral, work done by US funded initiatives, you name it. So more than a thousand. So it is certainly crucial also based on the volume. I just put here a few illustrative initiatives that have been going on or are still going on and in some cases are about to start uh, or have started recently in the targeted countries. So in Mexico, for instance, USAID has a crime and violence prevention program, which is you know follow up of a previous crime and violence prevention program, a justice sector activity in El Salvador, um, a few ones, crime and violence prevention, you know, Alianza Joven, Soluciones, the justice sector strengthening program in Honduras, also a justice sector program called, you know, Unidos Pro Ponte Mas, the, the tertiary violence prevention, in, the, in which this case PDF is the implementer, uh, school-based violence prevention, Asegurando la Educación. So those just give you, uh, I guess, a flavor of the wide array of interventions that are, like, and in this case, only USAID activities. I'm not even including INL-funded activities and activities that are funded that might not be considered per se crime and violence prevention, but have crime and violence prevention or citizen security components. I didn't list there many municipal activities or democracy and governance or human rights activities that USAID or another branch, another bureau in the State Department funds or the European Union or the IDB or the World Bank. So you, you find sometimes, you know, a program that is titled a, you know, improving governance and municipality services. But then when you look at it, 30% uh, of the budget is devoted to crime and violence prevention at the municipal level. So that's, that's why another reason why uh, the topic of, of uh, women and citizen security is extremely, extremely relevant. And citizen security will continue to be a priority. Uh, in the, in the, although we have seen progress and we are extremely happy to see even more progress and we hope that the region achieves the level of peace that you, know, you witness in other parts of the world, um, that will not happen overnight. So it will continue to be a priority um, due to high co economic cost, how it's a catalyst for migration, it's an impediment to rule of law, and it's the context in which gross human rights violations occur um, throughout the region. Um, how are we going to work about? Um, so we have the, the OES um, Inter-American Commission of Women. Uh, we have the unit that I am honored to, to lead, Peace, Justice, and Security at PADF. We also have the team in the Mexico and Central America unit, a country directors that PADF has on each of the targeted countries, and finally, local experts and consultants. That's mostly the human resources structure, but of course, we hope to partner with as, as many um, stakeholders as, as possible on each of the targeted countries to conduct to conduct the research. Um, basically, as I mentioned a little bit of the research objectives. Um, increase the knowledge, of course, map out existing knowledge, disseminate gaps on issues that have not been commonly addressed uh, in the space of citizen security, women, gender, uh, and facilitate the creation of a community of practice, which I guess this event serves as the beginning. I hope that uh, uh, many of you would certainly like to be a member of that community of practice. We hope to have people from DC, also from each of the targeted countries, and we hope to even go beyond. Um, you know, in interested parties in you know Jamaica, Colombia, Guatemala, Dominican Republic, Haiti, you name it, to to grow this community of of practice that initially will be online, uh, but we hope that as part of the project closure, we'll have. Uh, final event in DC, so uh, most of the members of the community of practice can certainly attend uh, a, an in-person event in, in Washington, in Washington DC. The process, I uh, will not go mo too much into it because most of you have done quantitative and qualitative research yourself, but basically uh, we're going to do uh, as many methods as, as possible, as the budget allows it, I guess. Um, key informant interviews, focus groups, on-site visits, um, qualitative and quantitative research um, to some degree, particularly desk reviews um, and, so, and so forth. And as I mentioned, um, the, the community of practice uh, will be uh, initially uh, online. We hope that from there we can create an advisory um, group for, for project activities, um, include other countries, even though we will not necessarily conduct research on those countries. We hope that people from those countries can join um, and facilitate the, the share, the, the inter-exchange of, of ideas on this, on this relevant topic. 
um, as um, a closing um, closing statements, I would certainly like to thank again uh, the the trust that USAID uh, put on the OAS uh, and PADF. Although I cannot speak for the OAS, but I guess take it. Let's take it together. The OAS and PADF. Hillary's, um, Hillary's not. Uh, the, uh, the trust for all you know the USAID placed on us. We hope to uh, be finding relevant information throughout this process. Uh, as you can imagine, um, uh, this is just the kickoff, so we will not be sharing anything about those countries today, but we'll keep you informed. And we, throughout the research project, we will have uh, several moments in which we'll start disseminating findings from the work on the, on the field. Um, so that's my first words of thanks to USAID. And also I would like to, uh, to thank our, our panelists uh, today who um, gracefully accepted our invitation uh, on this cold morning. Mm -hmm. um, I hope that the coffee outside made it a little bit more bearable coming from the, from the, from the, from the street. Uh, but um, and we're happy to, to have you here, so thank you for, for joining us this morning. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Roberto. I'm going to invite you to find seats in the audience, and I'm going to invite our wonderful panelists up to uh, join me. You have, in, you may sit anywhere you would like at the table. Uh, you have their bios in the material that's distributed, uh, so I won't go into detail. Uh, the lovely lady in red, uh, <laughs> Andrea Bertone. <laughs> Uh, who has known and worked for many years with Niyati Shah, uh, uh, my friend and ex-colleague <laughs> from USAID, and Pierre DeLuca uh, from the uh, Public Security Division of the OAS. So as I said, what we hope this will be an interactive session. Mm -hmm. Oh, can you hear me? I tend to not use the microphone, but yes, OK. Um, uh, I'm going to ask a few questions to, uh, to the panelists. Uh, I know the setup is a little formal, but feel free to talk to each other. Um, and, and then we're going to open it up for uh, questions. Um, so I'd like to start with um, a kickoff question to all of you, but I'm going to start with you, Andrea. And, um, today is March 7th. As, as Hillary and Roberto mentioned, tomorrow is the International Day of Women, which tends to be, I see it, as a day of celebration. Uh, today is a bit more serious, but we want to start on the positive mm -hmm. um, and look at what does success look like mm -hmm. when we apply gender considerations to programs, mm -hmm. uh, generally, but especially in the citizen security space. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much to Roberto for the invitation to participate, and, and I wish you a lot of luck as you kick off this very interesting project. Uh, so I am from FHI 360, which is an international development organization. I've been working in the development space on women and gender issues for over 20 years and and so I've seen a lot of uh, good things in the programs that we've done and many organizations have done but maybe just before I go into the successes I can start with well what are the challenges that we're trying to address and then what are the best ways or the most promising ways to address them and when uh, when we came up with this question I was thinking about okay in the context of a couple of different domains for example uh, economic uh, social political interpersonal and personal for women what are the the most challenging things that women and girls are facing. So within the economic space, for example, women we know have an inability to participate fully in the economies of their countries. They don't always have the requisite skills that they need to participate, and they can't always get access to those skills for multiple reasons. And a lot of those reasons are gendered, which I'm sure we'll go more into. Um, many of the women's economic empowerment programs focus on 
trying to uh, bring out the entrepreneurial skills of women, which is extremely important. But of course, not all women are entrepreneurs. Um, so we want to make sure that we're providing an array of options to women and girls to fully access all of the different kinds of sectors that they could possibly go into uh, in, in their countries in their societies. From a social perspective, we are uh, looking at um, access to education. And of course, we know that in many countries, have many countries have reached parity for girls and boys at the primary school level, but that's not the case in the secondary level and certainly not at the tertiary level. Uh, we are seeing a lot of promising things happening at the secondary level, though a lot of governments are prioritizing the building of new secondary schools, making it easier for girls and boys to access, making transportation easier. All of those are you know, excellent uh, programs and initiatives that governments and, and, of course, international development organizations are involved with. But um, we're also, of course, seeing high rates of early marriage, um, pregnancy, early pregnancy, and um, and as Roberto alluded to before, insecurity that many girls and women face, and Hillary mentioned this as well, it, every, in every stage of a woman and girl's life, in every space that she's in, she has the she's at risk of being insecure, being violated, um, and and so we have to be paying attention and figure out the best ways to address those. From a political perspective, we still see there is a barrier in access to being able to participate fully in public life, um, being able to vote, uh, either because of legal sanctions, because of social sanctions, because of the insecurity of being in, in a public space. So those are all risks to, to women to fully participate politically. Um, from an interpersonal perspective, of course, high rates of domestic violence, intimate partner violence, uh, relationships with families, and having to adhere strongly to social and gender norms that, uh, you know, um, the, that sanction a particular way for a, a woman or a girl to be or to do or, or um, that uh, deems appropriate what a girl or a woman can do. Um, and then from a personal perspective, we, a woman, women and girls have to address their own personal health, including disease or mental health or forms of disability. And so these, um, that of course uh, impedes her from being able to fully participate in all of these other, other uh, forms of, of uh, engagement outside. But um, on the promising side, things are looking up. <laughs> and uh, so we, women are making enormous contributions economically. Uh, we see women much more engaged in agriculture, in businesses, on farms, as entrepreneur, un, entrepreneurs, as employees. Uh, we are seeing greater levels of women and girls entering school uh, in secondary and tertiary level. Uh, we, I think access to uh, information, access to the internet gives women and girls more information about how to protect themselves, how to access certain services, how to perhaps access reproductive health services. And, um, and we are seeing, although it is very slow, we are seeing organizations and businesses and governments paying attention, paying more attention to anti-harassment in the workplace and removing uh, and making workplaces more equitable and, and more safe for women and girls, although that is still a huge issue. I think we're talking about it now, which, which is a good thing. Um, and uh, I'm also, the last thing I'll say is that you know, laws are changing, which removes institutional barriers to access a lot of different services. Um, and we're seeing more governments uh, budgeting for gender and, and women's issues more readily. So I will stop there, but these are just some things we can continue to talk about. Thank you, Andrea. I really appreciate it. And to put the challenges in perspective specifically for this region, uh, 
In Latin America and the Caribbean, there are 250 million people, mostly women and children, who are either living in poverty or who are excluded, politically, socially, economically excluded, and I include in that digital and financial exclusion uh, as per data from the mm -hmm. IDB. So so thank you for laying out that, that broad panorama. I'm going to turn to Niyati. I'm told I have to use the microphone for the webcast, so <laughs> thank you for those who are um, uh, with us today in a virtual space. Absolutely. Uh, please, your comments. Thank you. Nianti. Thank you. And thank you for having me. It's wonderful to see a, a packed room to discuss these important issues. Um, I'll piggy bank on um, a lot of your comments. Uh, you know, I think overall, archingly, we see success um, because we see more sustainable outcomes across all of our sectors when we address gender barriers. Um, and the reason that we've been able to make so much progress at USAID, I think one of the main reasons is that we have a very strong policy. We've been doing gender work before that, um, absolutely, but the policy really codified certain parameters that we needed in place so that there was a there was a broader understanding of what we mean by mainstreaming gender and what that looks like in programming and how we do that. And part of that is it outlined throughout the policy in terms of conducting a gender analysis required for all of our work, but it also really speaks to the fact that you need technical experts and expertise to implement that work and that can't just fall on, on the shoulders of a gender advisor or five gender advisors. And so everyone really has a stake in um, advancing gender and gender equality and addressing these barriers across our programming. Um, the policy also has three main objectives, um, which are really meant to be quite broad and really allow us to address inequality across sectors, including justice, women, peace and security, and justice and citizen security. Um, and they look at reducing barriers to socioeconomic, political um, engagement, reducing and mitigating gender-based violence, which Roberto spoke about, as, spoke about as well, that's across the world and also increasing women and girls' ability to be agents of change in their own world, to make decisions that better their life, and to choose and to have freedom. Um, and so all of these three objectives really allow us to dig deeper and address these inequalities in an intersectional way. Um, and we had a recent evaluation of our policy that's available online. I highly recommend reading it because it goes into a number of our successes and it also looks at some of our challenges um, which are ongoing and um, resources are needed so it's one thing to say let's integrate gender into programming and it's another if there's no budget or resource allocation for it and that includes people as well so having the people to do it um, we need data we need really good rigorous data that's consistent and we need to develop indicators and monitor on a continual basis and again share that information out um, and luckily, we do work really well with our hand, with our partners, with other government counterparts, and we're seeing, I think, an increased not just awareness but energy for us to address these gender issues because we do see that when we engage um, in an intersectional way, including men, sensitizing um, men, and including women, and really discussing these issues on the forefront. We're closing the gender gaps and we're improving our outcomes. So it's both at the same time and they're not mutually exclusive, right? Thank you so much, Niati, for that view into policy and programming. Um, it's when we don't take a gender lens into account, we can have all sorts of unintended consequences and end up reinforcing uh, negative gender stereotypes. So, so thank you, and we'll we'll come back to to, to some of that. I also want to turn to to Pierre De Luca, and go explicitly and a little deeper into the security space. Roberto mentioned earlier being stunned by statistics. I heard some statistics recently, specifically about Mexico, that um, shocked me which is the what happens to women when they're arrested. So if you're arrested by the Mexican Navy, 40, there's a four, and you are a woman, there's a 40% chance that you will be raped. In other words, 40% of women arrested by the Navy are raped. 
and that's 20% for the Army. Um, we count on security forces to protect us. So I think to me it adds a uh, frightening and personal dimension to the problem. Um, so Pierre, I don't, don't need to talk about Mexico specifically, but perhaps um, you could tell us a little bit about how you're looking at the gender dimension in public security. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here um, and be representing the Department of Public Security. So before I answer your question, and I guess we're moving from the positive note uh, to a very tragic situation, um, but I just wanted to give some context of the Department of Public Security of the OAS. Um, we have received a number of mandates from our member states to work in strengthening the capacities of the countries in the Americas to prevent, reduce, and address crime in a broad spectrum. Uh, but of course, some of those mandates speak particularly to the issues of violence against women and how to incorporate the gender perspective across the entire criminal justice system. As Hillary mentioned before, uh, uh, we partner with uh, the Inter-American Commission uh, of Women, and we're very fortunate to count with their inputs. So since the design of our projects, we are always sensitive to the issues of how we can incorporate that gender lens. Um, and before we go to the particular issue of women in prison, women in law enforcement offices, um, I think uh, it's good to just give a broad panorama in the area of citizen security of what are some of the challenges that women face. Um, the first and foremost is the one that we have mentioned early this morning in terms of violence against women and how women is impacted by different crimes. So for instance, human trafficking, you see that women uh, it's majority represented as human trafficking victims. Almost 70% of the human trafficking victims are women and girls. Um, but besides being victimized, women also are criminalized. And uh, um, I think uh, that's one of the issues that are most invisible, even because the prison system as a whole, it's one of the topics that it's not heated in the agenda um, uh, and another public perception, especially in our countries with high rates of impunity high rates of violence, so uh, we tend to ignore the crisis of the prison system um, and we tend to think or the perception and even fostered by some politicians is that we shouldn't invest in the prison system, that criminals don't deserve investment. Um, but then we see that cycle of violence because you see high rates of recidivism and becomes a cycle. Um, so particularly in terms of women in prison, the statistics are very frightening, as Kate mentioned. Um, law enforcement agencies are not prepared to deal with women, nor as victims or as defendants, as victims as well, right? We know that when victims try to report rape, uh, report domestic violence, they are discredited, they are shamed, they are guilted. Um, so that generates another issue of underreporting and lack of data, and the issue becomes invisible as well. And the same thing goes when women are defendants or are criminalized. So uh, we see that the majority of the prison population is male, but the rates of women incarceration are growing way higher than male incarceration. So in the last 10 years, the overall prison population of the world grew by 20% and the women prison population by 50%. So it is growing much higher than men, and this tends to become one of the issues that we will have to deal with for a number of reasons. First of all, the, in our region, the prison system is in a state of decay, and particularly women suffer and experience that in a different way. So uh, you have less prison facilities that are developed considering the needs of the women, the spaces that they have to have. Some of the legislation of our countries allow women to have their children with them. So you should need, you need to have proper spaces to accommodate them, and you don't. You don't see that. Sometimes you don't even have prisons exclusive for females. So they are in prison with males, which also expose them to the risk of being sexually abused, being um, or suffering other forms of violence as well. Um, and um, 
the impact of the incarceration of women goes beyond the women that are in the prison. The majority of the women that are in prison either pro are the primary caregivers of their families. They come from situations of exclusion, high vulnerability, and when they are removed from their families and they are put in prison, for the majority of times, for crimes that are non-violent crimes, we have to bear in mind that the women are being put in prison for mostly drug-related crimes that are committed in a lot of cases because of their association with a male partner. Sometimes they are pressured um, to take drugs from one location to the other, or even to take drugs and weapons inside the prison to their male partner. And when they get caught, they are criminalized. Um, so when they are removed from that family, you already have the pa both parents sometimes incarcerated. And that family becomes an, a, a very, you increase the vulnerability of that family and you see a cycle of violence. So studies indicate that uh, children that have parents incarcerated are in a much higher risk and likelihood of engaging in criminal behavior. So we also have to consider not only the impact of the policies directly to the women, but how we lacking that gender perspective, we are replicating that effect and it goes beyond women. It goes to men, it goes to boys. So the exclusion of women in the citizen security agenda um, also has that limitation of really uh, preventing our policies of being more effective. Uh, we see that for citizen security, the incorporation of women, the design and implementation of policies uh, can be something that it has a, a great potential to achieve success. Um, so you see a lot of violence interrupter programs uh, for gang disengagement where the women are central. You see that the women have that role in the community that they can develop trust and can really interrupt violence and reduce lethal violence. So I I think it's a number of issues in the Department of Public Security we are trying to work um, in incorporating in our projects perspectives that use uh, women in all these roles. So as protagonists, as the direct beneficiaries of the policies, um, and as the women impacted by like, a reflection of that policy. And just to give you a positive note, since we started on a positive note, I want to give a specific example uh, of what success looked like for us. So we implement a project with funds of USA, Jamaica, uh, in Jamaica with the Trust for the Americas. It's a project to um, strengthen the reintegration services for youth in conflict with law. Uh, to reduce recidivism rates. So we work with girls and boys, and I'm going to be happy to give more details of this project later on. But just for now, I want to mention how for us was really important that we work with the girls inside the center. And, and when they are released, we follow up with them. Uh, we give economic opportunities sometimes for entrepreneurships, sometimes for job placements. And now we've seen some of those girls come back to the center and be mentor of the girls that are inside. Uh, and we see powerful moments where you have focus groups and you see that girl saying, when you leave, you're going to work for me. You're going to work in my hair salon. So don't worry, I have your back. So I think for us, this is a moment of success. It's really empowered women, empowering women. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a, that's a nice way of ending uh, my intervention with a positive <laughs> note. <laughs> Thank you, Pierre. Appreciate that. Um, Andrea, I uh, saw you taking furious notes as <laughs> Pierre was speaking. I'd mm -hmm. love to hear your reactions. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank you. I mean, the statistics always are always so powerful, so thank you for, for that. I mean, I think for me, you know, the gender lens is so key. And what is really exciting is to hear Roberto's presentation, not only just talking about women and girls, but talking about the gender lens, talking about the interactions, the dynamics between men and women, boys and girls. And also, you mentioned uh, diverse gender identities. Again, this is what we really need to be moving towards in, ha in having a better understanding. Uh, and you know, taking that time at the beginning of, of every project to do what 
what I'm sure many of you are familiar with, the gender analysis. We've been expanding that to talk about gender and social inclusion analysis. So for us, it's looking at the intersections of, of multiple identities. We know that a person is not only their gender, they, there's so much more about them. They, they may have a disability, they may come from an underprivileged background, they may be a, a racial or ethnic minority in their particular context. And so how do you understand uh, all of the, the uh, multiple dimensions of a person and how they, how they experience and interact with the world. Um, what are the expectations and the roles and responsibilities that have been in, imposed on them and how does that impact their ability to then uh, go to school, get a job, you know, be contributing members of their society. For me, uh, you know, look, doing that analysis, doing that investigating before you start a uh, program and then taking that knowledge and really building it in, and baking it into the DNA of a project is so very important. Thank you so much, Andrea. Uh, Niyati, one of the things that um, uh, Peer was talking about and, and that uh, Andrea has alluded to is sort of the the, 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 the always paying attention as well as the cyclical nature of, of the problems and the challenges. Can you talk a little bit about how you see that? How do we get at the root causes? How do we break the cycles? Um, well, I think um, I'm going to continue to harp on the, the gender analysis <laughs> because that's part of how we address the root causes. Um, as we were talking about addressing gender inequalities within the program is not a static one-off. Um, and as we move through the world with our intersectional identities and experience and begin to shift the way we move through the world because we are offered and afforded our rights and opportunities as we should, then that happens in relation to an enabling environment. So it's not enough to just work with the citizens on the ground, but what inner, what institutions, what are the structural barriers as well? And the analyses really helps us get at the different levels and the areas that need to be looked at. And it might be outside of the realm of your particular project, but there are essentially always other organizations that are working on some of these other their um, linkages and structural barriers. So how can you link what you're doing with what's already on the ground and continue to build capacity and ensure those linkages are functional? And this is especially important when we look at gender-based violence, right? Um, a number of our interventions really focus, I come from the health sector, at, it's often the first place a person will go when they are have experienced violence. And so we've worked heavily to train providers and sensitize providers on providing respectful, dignified care and ensuring that if services are offered, that they're fully available. So someone can go there not just for medical, but for psychosocial, for legal, and that all those linkages and those referrals are actually functioning and are also gender sensitive. Because if you have any break along that chain, for example, if they if they're not able to report it, um, if they're going to experience more violence upon reporting it, if they're going to be thrown in jail upon reporting it, why would they report? And so we don't actually have accurate numbers going back to data on the violence that women experience. Um, and we're not even including youth in that because that's a whole other level. Um, but they experience it at multiple levels as well. Um, and what happens in the home as... Um, we talk, discussed earlier is we see the high, some of the highest rates of violence um, and they're often not linked to what we see in other spaces in some of these, um, in jails, in prisons, etc. cetera. Um, so we have double layers of um, areas where we're seeing inequalities and, and um, violence. Um, so it's really important that when we're working on the design of programming that we really look at it from a holistic standpoint. Um, and work with, as I said, and which is great that your program is going to be doing this, existing players on the ground. Um, and to the extent that's possible, building that capacity, supporting that capacity, and continue so that when the program ends, they're still going, right? And finding ways to also link to future funding. I think that's really important. A lot of the organizations that we work with rely on 
the minimal funding that comes in? Is there a way for um, them to be linked with the next implementing partner that's coming on board, right? So thinking forward, um, and we, we tend to use this, there's a great continuum, one of the tools that we use, the gender continuum. And it's one thing to be gender aware, that's part of the tool, that's when you conduct the analysis. Um, but how can we move so that we're more transformative? How can we begin to transform these root causes um, on multiple levels and that's what our programs all need to be aiming towards in different ways and at different levels. Thank you, Niati. So we need the right policies in place, we need to do the right analysis, we need to have a vision of how we can be gender transformative. What about some of the tools? Um, Andrea, can you tell us a little bit, what are some of the tools that we should think about, um, whether it's analytical tools or project-specific tools? Right. So one of the things that uh, we, and in my organization, we are about 4,500 staff in 60 countries. And so we have, you know, Obviously, just like OAS and USAID and, and many other large organizations, we have so many cultures, so many people who work for us who come from different backgrounds. Uh, my organization, FHI 360, has really taken uh, the, has, has prioritized what we call gender mainstreaming and gender integration or gender and social inclusion mainstreaming and gender and social inclusion integration. And we make a distinction with these two terms, mainstreaming and integration. We, um, we talk about mainstreaming in the context of our policies and our processes as an organization. So it's not, it's, it's not good enough for us to just say we're going to integrate gender in our programs and it's somebody else's responsibility to do that but we as an organization need to be walking the talk walking the talk talking the talk <laughs> whatever All the term is <laughs> uh, and so we've recently launched uh, a gender and social inclusion framework um, that is our or a set of standards for our organization and we have um, also revised our harassment, violence, and safeguarding policies. Uh, so we are being much more, uh, we're being much more, we're having stronger policies on, on preventing and responding to harassment throughout our organization, and also making sure that our participants in our projects uh, are not experiencing any form of violence, especially sexual exploitation and abuse, and that we've put in place the systems of response and and support to, to those participants. So for us, one of the tools is really making sure our policies are very strong uh, and to, to build capacity across the organization. The more people who embrace these principles and standards the better we will be in adhering to the standards that we set. So organizational policies for me is a very strong tool to be able to do that work. And then when we are actually working on our programs, we work in health, we work in education, civil society, youth, uh, citizen security. We have we also have a project in Jamaica, for example, that focuses on social entrepreneurs and citizen security. It's a very interesting uh, intersection of, of issues. And so we we do those analyses, we, and, and more and more we are integrating additional domains of analysis into more traditional gender analyses. Um, so we're looking at people's dignity, we're looking at people's wellness and safety, and these are part of the questions that we ask when we're doing focus group discussions, uh, because again, looking at the intersections, what is the what is the full uh, identity of this person and, and how does that uh, impact their ability to access services and, and many other things. Um, so, uh, and, and just one last point to build on what uh, Niti said on the, um, on the transformative aspect of our programming. So we are not 
only empowering women and girls and focusing on the education and economics and um, political access for girls and women. We're also engaging men. We want them to understand what their, uh, what the dynamics, the social and gender dynamics that have been socially constructed in their societies, how that impedes or, or provides opportunities for them to also excel. Uh, and, and then, you know, bringing together men and women and people of diverse gender identities to then fully uh, be able to explore how can they work together more effectively to bring about change and, and um, whatever the project is, maybe it's an education project, maybe it's a civil society project, but that engagement of with girls and, and women, with men and boys, and then really bringing them together to, to, to fully benefit from what they've learned for us, that's um, you know getting on the road of a transformative project. That's terrific. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, Pierre, how would you look at mainstreaming, uh, and do you define it the same way that Andrea does? And 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 how do you look at bringing in other stakeholders? And Niati, I'm going to ask you the same thing right after. <laughs> Um, I think it, I think there are a lot of um, similarities of what do we do, and I guess that's that's a positive point, right? That all organizations are aligned uh, in what we're doing. So as I mentioned before, we do have the advantage of having the Inter-American Commission of Women in the OAS. Um, so as part of like, and I think that's one of the organizational tools that Andrea was mentioning. Um, as part of the framework here, that how we operate any project that we conduct, they have to review it and make sure that. But even if we um, forget or if we didn't include that perspective, that it's there. Um, so it is a great uh, tool to enforce that across the entire organization and all departments, not only multidimensional security, but um, democracy, sustainable development, they all have to incorporate that gender perspective. So that's one tool that we have inside the organization. But all in our, in our projects, uh, I think the biggest tool that we try to uh, push for the gender perspective is um, the first strategy is to increase the participation of women in the public policy development in citizen security area and in the law enforcement agencies and the criminal justice system sector. So some of our projects, they really look at how we are restructuring the police forces in the Americas, for instance, um, to have greater participation of women, to have women in positions of um, that they are able to manage the organization because it's not only about having more women, but it's women in positions of power as well. The higher you look at an organization, you tend to see less women in those positions. Um, and it's particular in the area of citizen security, a very traditional and male-based area. Um, and the, by being male-based and transforming that and including more women, we are also transforming the focus of these organizations. Law enforcement is very much, um, in some of our countries, is still based in the perspective of the warrior, those um, norms associated with gender, like aggressive violence, and that leads to police abuse um, and not a very effective investigation. So by putting more women there, we are also um, assisting the organization to be more democratic, to operate in the rule of law. Um, so I think that's another tool that we, we use. One of our projects, for instance, we always try to have at least half of the women that are um, training in police uh, age force agencies. Um, be women. Um, the other tool that we do have um, is working with the in the policy level. Um, and in the policy level, the OAS has the advantage of having the political forums here and having ambassadors and having the high level discussion. So we have, um, for instance, developed the hemispheric plan to prevent and reduce intentional homicides. And in that plan, you incorporate as one of the priorities femicide and the omission of violence against women. Um, so that plan is approved by all the member states and then we assist them in implementing. So by having women as one of the priorities, by having femicide as one of the issues, you really bring attention to that uh, problem. Because as we mentioned before here, one of the challenges is that violence against women or the impact of the criminal justice system for women is invisible. So we have to make it more visible. And, and those plans, and uh, we do that. And the last thing is data. 
we, we don't really have data, reliable data, standardized data that allow us to have a more detailed understanding of the phenomenon, the root causes, what is the dimension of the problem. So right now, one of the things that we are working on is really standardize how we collect data in the Americas. And one of the particular things that we want to do is with femicides, because femicides in each country is reported in a different way. Some countries only understand femicides as the homicide uh, perpetrated in the home place, other countries understand that it's any homicide, that the victim is a woman, that it was based on being a woman, which you know that is the majority of the cases. The majority of women are murdered by being women, which is very different of the murder of men. Um, so the data that we collect have to be disaggregated by gender. Of course, all the data that we collected in the department is disaggregated by gender, but we also have to work in those indicators and in those reporting mechanisms that we can really understand what is going on in the Americas and how we can work in a hemispherical way and build those bridges and those alliances between the countries. Thank you, Pierre. Very, very helpful. Niati, your perspective. Yes, yes. So we have a number of tools. Um, we don't prescribe when we conduct gender analyses one certain tool, but we have a number of toolkits that our implementing partners have developed that include different ways of of cutting up the apple, so to speak. Um, so different ways of analyzing laws and policies, cultural norms, time use, so really digging down into those. And there are some great toolkits that include potential questions that you could ask in these focus group discussions or key informant interviews. Um, and these are important tools because I think a lot of them, I work in the health sector, are developed in the health sector, but they do translate across sectors and they can be modified. Um, and that's one thing that we're, we're trying to do more of at USAID is um, share across sectors what we're using that is useful and find ways to um, share that knowledge and those tools uh, across our work. Um, the other tool that I mentioned, the Gender Equality Continuum tool, is a great tool to not just for program design, but also to monitor and evaluate if you're moving towards a more transformative approach. Um, we also have a number of um, tools that are embedded within our program cycle. So from the bat, from the beginning of our writing RFPs, ensuring that gender is integrated into RFPs in the design process, working with our implementing partners, um, beyond going to the gender analysis. So you have this analysis, it's beautiful. Are you using it? Um, and the way you apply it is, as we've developed in, in some of our sectors, is working with our partners to say, create a, a short gender strategy. And this isn't a recap of the gender analysis, but this relates directly to the, the program goals. So if the program is to improve citizen security, what are are the specific gender-related interventions that are going into that project that are based on the analysis, so really closing the loop. Um, and the other piece is, is data as well, so ensuring that there are indicators, some of which are on the higher level that have been vetted and um, are, are available through a number of these toolkits or custom indicators. And usually we like to ask for both um, because a program has its own flavors and objectives. We want to ensure that we're programming those specific objectives, but also looking at not just number of women, which is also important, but have attitudes, norms, and behaviors changed? Are these communities viewing women and men as equals? Um, do girls really feel like they have agency and voice? Um, and these are harder things to measure, um, absolutely, but some organizations such as JPAL, Data2x has some good um, indicators as well of really looking at measuring empowerment and ensuring that we're not looking at empowerment as an end goal, but as a process, right? So me making sure that we measure the process of empowerment and then sharing that out because this isn't um, something that we all have one answer to and there's never going to be one answer. So I think the the ability to convene and share that knowledge is really important and we try to do that as well with our partners. We have a number of gender summits which you've hosted. Um, we've hosted a number of um, brown bags and um, these types of events and I think it's really important that we continue to do that. Thank you, Nyati. A um, couple things to all three panelists. So on the one hand, we've heard that uh, there's a much greater proportion of women than men um, uh, being killed, murdered by people they know, typically an intimate partner or 
family member. I think it's six times the number of women than men. Um, we've also heard from Roberto and others how insecurity and violence is a driver for migration. Um, and we know that migration and other forms of vulnerability often lead to human trafficking, uh, where although there's a rise in the number of children and men being trafficked, it still is predominantly uh, women. How do we, how do we reconcile uh, all of that? How do we... Um, You've talked about policy. You've talked about uh, bringing toolkits and logic and, and analysis and applying that to our projects. But there's a, 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 a broader phenomenon of migration and uh, violence. You've also talked about trying to connect the dots and ensuring continuity of projects. What will, when we look at the broader situation, this is a bigger question, what's what type of scale, what kind of critical mass do we need in what types of activities or uh, even events? What needs to happen to change the game? And I'll open it to whoever would like to answer. I, I can take a first stab at it. So thank you. That's really interesting. And <laughs> there's a lot to unpack in, in your comments. The first thing I, I would like to just comment on is the issue around men and violence and how they play a role in our broader discourse on gender-based violence. And it is true when we talk about gender-based violence, we are primarily referring to women and girls. We most most of the time focus on women and girls because they are the majority of people who are uh, impacted by this phenomenon. However, it is really interesting, I think, to look at the issues around masculinity, violence, and insecurity. Security. And many of the reasons why men fight with other men or might or, or boys fight against boys are, um, are gendered reasons. And so again, we have to go back to those tools that we have to investigate the reasons underlying the motivation to, to exercise power over someone else. The other thing is that, you know, societies define what it means to be male and female. And so just as uh, these gendered roles have been constructed, they can be deconstructed, they can be reconstructed. And we need to be having, or societies need to be having those conversations. They need to be healthy conversations in the space of the media and educate in this, in the education and workforce. Um, and every and and that applies to every single country. And so I think that's really fascinating to kind of take a look at what is the the social discourse around uh, around violence and men and and uh, and female and male. Uh, I, I conducted a gender and social inclusion analysis of this project that we that FHI 360 has in Jamaica a couple of years ago, and the. As I mentioned, the project <clears throat> bolsters social entrepreneurs in order to reduce levels of citizen insecurity. And we were trying uh, to find the links between masculinity and citizen insecurity. And it was very interesting because aspects of, of Jamaican masculinity of form a life cycle of disenfranchisement for men. Uh, and a, a male, for example, in a low, lower socioeconomic space in Jamaica is discouraged from going to school and completing his education. He is sent to the streets by his <clears throat> family and peers to find work and uh, to earn an income as, uh, as a boy. And he's pressured to father many children, which then leaves him in, a, in unable to actually support those children. And um, what it means to be a man in Jamaica places him at greater risk uh, for being exposed uh, to violence and to perpetuate violence. And then it diminishes a man's ability to develop a support ne network for himself. So it's very interesting, in Jamaican hospitals, there are a lot of men uh, who have lost their family networks because they they kind of got separated and 
they couldn't support their families, their families rejected them. So you see a lot of men, older men, uh, who just don't have access and don't have that social network any longer. I think these are fascinating questions and we really haven't had a chance to to explore them in, in many societies. Um, so on the masculinity side, I think it's um, super interesting. And just a comment on trafficking. So I have been studying trafficking for a long time. Uh, I got my PhD, disserta- did my PhD dissertation on trafficking in Southeast Asia. So it's, I teach at GW on trafficking for about 16 years. So I've been thinking about it. We could talk about it for a long time. But um, <laughs> one of the things I'm gonna say is I'm actually very interested in the connections between international development and anti-trafficking. And was just talking with Niti before about the fact that the international development community does not talk very well or interface very well with the anti-trafficking community. They tend to be rather separate. And I really feel like the international development community has so much to contribute to the anti-trafficking movement primarily because a lot of the work that we do in in international development is about reducing vulnerabilities. And really, vulnerability plus exploitation is at the foundation of why people are trafficked. Uh, So um, I feel like maybe we can have another follow-up panel to talk about these (laughs) issues because it's it's really fascinating. Thank you. I'd love to just quickly follow up on... Um, particularly the piece about masculinities. A lot of our work as is looking at and is actively implementing um, programs that are l- working with both women and men. Um, and one that I wanted to highlight, because you asked for a couple examples that are outside of LAC, I work a lot in sub-Saharan Africa and northern Uganda, um, the community there experiences high rates of violence and particularly women um, and pregnant women. This came up in one of the de- dem- demographic health, health surveys um, that violence in the last five years has actually increased uh, sexual and intimate partner violence of pregnant women. And um, this program that was implemented there was really looking at first-time parents. So one of the things that we can do is really start with the youth. Um, And parents are, first-time parents might even be a little bit too late. So the younger you can work before these norms are formed fully um, and before societal interventions begin to construct what it means to be a woman and man, um, that happens in the family as well. So this intervention was really... um, really had some great successes in not only decreasing violence, but increasing the the levels of egalitarianism in the household level, where both women and both the husband and, and the wife felt like they had equal um, voice and ability to communicate with each other without resorting to violence, without resorting to um other forms of abuse, essentially. Um, Not that that was the only driving factor, but certainly one of them. And what we see is with the cycle of violence is perpetrators are often victims of violence themselves. And we know from the Violence Against Children surveys that have been conducted through PEPFAR and a number of other um, organizations, they're quite high. Um, and we, we tend to, I think, ignore the space that happens between children and adults. And I think that's a really formative area that we need to continue to focus on. So to the extent that very important that we continue the response work, that we really work in the prevention realm in a way that is more holistic and addresses, um, the drivers, which are in relation to each other. So men and women, um, And the other piece I wanted to just quickly mention is um, child marriage. We're doing a lot of work on child marriage, which is also another form of gender-based violence and a really innovative current um, program that's happening in Kenya where we're working with um, the community, the the tribal community and faith-based leaders. Um, So really working with already transformed and progressive faith-based leaders to begin to reinterpret what some of these cultural, social, and religious norms are around marriage and looking at the issues of poverty that are the root cause of why child marriage occurs in many of these communities. You can't afford to have a young girl in the house and this person can take care of her. It's also considered a rite of passage. Many of these um, areas of interventions were, um, I think, successfully implemented in this program. So it's really exciting to see different ways of looking at the norms and ensuring that we look at the cultural, the gender, the religious, and how they intertwine with each other. 
Kate, if I may add two comments, brief comments. The first one, of course, uh, trafficking in persons is something that we really need more time to discuss. But I just wanted to call attention to a phenomenon that it's very much connected and also impacts very much differently women, which is the migration. And I think we cannot ignore that topic with the entire crisis of Venezuela right now. And we will see in our region um, how that's going to play out. Uh, and we already seen, right? Um, and I think, uh, so I wanted to mention that the DPS has been working in the issue of migration through that citizen security lens and the gender-based perspective. So we just finished a project in um, Mesoamerica, so all Central America and Mexico, which before Venezuela had the highest inflow in the in the hemisphere of uh, migrants and irregular migration. And women particularly are exposed to much more risks than men when they are migrating. And then we see how those um, elements of vulnerability really play out because uh, even though women know and they are sometimes conscious that they will face challenges, that whenever they go through that irregular migration route, uh, they will be exposed to rape, to sexual violence, to other forms of abuse and they prepare for that. So we see that some women, uh, they prepare by um, birth control methods. So they are aware that they are exposed to violence, but the situation that they are currently living in, it's that drastic that they still have to go through that flow and expose themselves to that risk. So the prevention component is fundamental because you see that some women in our region really don't have an option. Uh, it's either staying and being uh, subjected to violence of gangs, uh, violence of law enforcement agencies, uh, of not having a means of survival, or trying that route and being exposed to sexual violence, being exposed to becoming victims of trafficking in persons and subjected to sexual exploitation. So um, this is one of the issues that it, um, it's the one of the biggest trends in our region and that it will be very important to keep that gender lens uh, of how we address the migration that it's only going to increase here. Um, and the other aspect, it's so interesting what you said, Andrea, about masculinity in Jamaica. So uh, we our project there, we are also working with boys and girls. And you see the flip side of what you mentioned. Um, so those same norms and gender norms, they have a uh, impact in why the girls are in correctional centers. So um, in the juvenile facilities in Jamaica, first of all, the majority of the girls have not committed crimes. Um, they are there because they are deemed uncontrollable. Jamaica, unfortunately, still has a legislation that allow for girls uh, that are deemed uncontrollable behavior uh, to be put in correctional centers. Uh, this is something that a number of international organizations are working to change uh, that legislation, but it is still happening. And so those girls enter correctional centers because they have been subjected to abuse, to traumatic experiences, and they run away from their houses. And uh, the runaway, the acting out in the schools can lead them to be in the correctional facilities. And that is stigma that is attached to women and to girls in conflict with the law that you see the double punishment. Uh, we already have this stigma of criminals overall, that taught, like the label of criminals when they are removed from the facilities. Um, it's harder for someone to get back to society, to find a job. But with women, it's a double punishment because we have that stereotype of what means to be a good woman, what means to be a good mother. And certainly being in prison is not one of the key elements of that. Um, so women is more stigmatized. Women that have been in conflict with the law is more stigmatized than men that have been in conflict with the law. Um, so those girls that have not even been in conflict with the law, but they are deemed criminal because they were in a correctional center, when they leave, they're they face many barriers and they cannot find a job, they cannot go back to that situation of abuse, and that lead them to actually finding older men that can take them in. And then you reproduce the cycle. And we see girls of 13, 14 years old getting pregnant, having kids, and then, of course, now having the parenting skills to gr raise that family. And that kind of closes that cycle of violence. And you see how masculinity and also what is expected of the gender norms of a female in Jamaica kind of play a role uh, in what is the situation of the country and the high rates of homicide, of gang violence, etc. So uh, it's very interesting how we can work with that in those projects. And we have to address both sides or we are not going to achieve success.
Thank you, Pierre. Terrific. So I think now's about the time when we're going to open it up for questions. I've seen a lot of nodding, uh, a lot of emphatic uh, movements uh, as, as these fantastic panelists have been sharing their views. Uh, I don't know if there's a microphone because of the webcast. If not, I will repeat the questions. But maybe um, is there if there's anyone who'd like to speak um, uh, can you raise your hand? Uh, so I see one, two, Kara, no, uh, Kara over here. Uh, oh, and the lady in red. Thank you so much to the presenters and everyone for being here. Wish you all uh, on the mark of International Women's Day a very happy uh, celebration uh, throughout this week. Uh, my name is Kara George. I'm uh, with USA and the Latin America Caribbean Bureau. And um, kind of one thing that I've thought about and kind of struggled with is this idea of when we work at an institutional level, country level, the many different levels that we can work at in the, um, the kind of programmatic interventions. When we think about how women um, in particular are re-victimized or, or are victimized in the process of receiving essential services uh, after whether it's a uh, incident of domestic violence, um, health, public space and security, and the kind of work that um, that we do at USAID and, and many of our you know kind of uh, partner organizations within this space, when we're working, for example, on um, police reform or uh, you know working at a local health institution of okay, here's how you can provide these integral services. My kind of thought that I've struggled with over a long time is when a woman or, or a group of women or any individual really have a negative experience, how that permeates kind of the rest of society and creates this thought and reputation of this institution is not trustworthy. And so when we through our programming are working on these reforms, how can we also target this behavior change or concept? So let's say you know, a person is a victim of a crime, they try to receive help from an institution, they are further victimized or, or violated through that process. How can we kind of turn that situation around to say, okay, this is a trustworthy group now, or this is now safe for you, um, and put that backing behind it? I hope I articulated that thought yes. well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Let's, let's hear a, at least a couple of questions, so maybe over there. Um, and then we'll let the panelists answer. Okay. Thanks so much. Uh, my name is Sarah Danish, and I uh, work with DAI. Um, Yati, Andrea, Pierre, Katie, this has all been really, really helpful, and I'm just appreciating that you've managed to, to showcase the multidimensional piece of, of security, um, even as we're taking a, a very gender lens to the conversation. I, I wanted to get your thoughts on indicators or metrics for success and kind of revisit that with a very, very quick preface about um, the case of El Salvador, where you have um, a national policy called Plan El Salvador Seguro. This is part of their uh, citizen security agenda. Uh, they've had it for several years now, and um, uh, with the new administration coming in, there'll probably be some, some reforms. Um, I was reading a, a report by a civil society organization that basically broke down the budget for Plan El Salvador Seguro, and when you when you get right to it, uh, the the majority of that budget is is dedicated to equipment um, for police forces, and and so however much talk there is about prevention, and you know I'm also mindful that maybe Roberto, you're going to want to talk to this question, but um, uh, the budget really winds up being dedicated to sort of repressive. Um, action and and getting to the heart of our conversation like where is the money for victim services and how is that being mobilized and if there is a line item is it being spent so is domestic resource mobilization around um, services for women a good indicator for us to be tracking is that a metric um, in the case of peer how do you have conversations to you know make that a priority with with our partners um, and if not that, what other kinds of indicators are priorities for you, whether it's health-related, um, workforce-related, um, political space-related? Thanks. Thank you. Nyati, you want to? Yes. Um, 
Thank you for the question. Um, yes, this is something that we've seen um, significantly happening in the health sector, um, specifically pregnant women um, going to antenatal care or to, to actually deliver their baby and experiencing abusive behavior from the very people that are delivering their baby, including withholding the baby for payment, for extra payment. Um, so there are levels of abuse and corruption that exist within all of our sectors and systems. And one of the ways that we've um, begun to address this is really working both on the supply and the demand side. So it's really important that um, women in community know what their rights are, their right to dignity, quality, care, um, respectful care. Um, but then also working with the providers and the health systems and working that from a local to a national level um, and ensuring that there's an accountability mechanism. So the White Ribbon Alliance, one of our partners, has really worked on ensuring that they train up citizen journalists and then the citizen journalists are, they are very um, honored within the community. They hold a lot of social capital and they are considered trustworthy um, arbiters of news, so to speak, and really making sure that that when a facility has gone through a transformation, has gone through some of these trainings and providers have um, checked their own biases, done some values clarification, tackled their own gender inequalities within the health system, that things can be improved. So it's really looking, looking at it from both the supply and the demand side as well. Um, and then quickly, just wanted to touch on the indicator piece. You bring up a really good um, point, and we often see that as well. Um, I think one of those indicators of domestic resource mobilization is certainly a good one. Um, I think other things that you can look at um, and that we've looked at in the health sector is um, – really working again from the community level all the way up to the national level and ensuring that there's some level of um, a platform for local organizations to advocate at the national level for social protection systems to be gender inclusive and responsive so that there's some level of funding that happens at that level and the, the country itself begins to take ownership that is then tracked through a system that has some accountability. So going back to accountability. Um, and the other thing that I would mention is um, the Women, Peace, and Security Act. Um, has USAID has taken this on to develop an incentive fund. Um, and they've, they've contributed and kind of deployed a number of um, small um, grants through a number, number of countries that have been able to show the efficacy of some of these programs of allocating resources specifically for prevention and, and protection and then use that as an advocacy tool to get more resources from um, governments and from local organizations in their local communities. Great. Thank you, Nati. Andrea. Yes, I, I might address the first question on behavior change and it sounded like you wanted you were asking more about institutional behavior change and how you build trust uh, for individuals who may not trust I, I think it's very interesting the senator from Arizona who just announced that she had been uh, sexually assaulted while she was in the Navy and the specific thing she said is that I, I didn't report because I didn't trust the system um, and it, that kind of resonated in my head just now when you said there's lack of trust in the system. And I think that's so key to institutional change of, of uh, and, and this is exactly what we're trying to do in FHI 360, and I know many other organizations are struggling with this themselves about how do you make the organization an open place for people to feel comfortable coming forward and reporting any kind of abuse that's happening and having the systems to be able to sensitively, effectively address those complaints. Before we even get to that point, though, we want to prevent it. You know, we want to put the systems in place where we're actually, where we're, we've created a, an enabling environment for people to come to work and feel that their, their voices and their work is valued on a daily basis, that we look at, uh, you know, um, equitable leadership in our organizations and we make sure that our policies are, are equitable and, um, and responsive. We train and we train and we train and we, um, 
capa build capacity. We don't just do one-off trainings on gender and say, okay, we're done, checked that box. <laughs> we do it over and over to reinforce these values. Um, and, and, you know, what works in one country office doesn't always work in another country office. So it has to be very contextually based. Uh, what happens, you know, in our HQ, we have 70% women and 30% men. Well, that's not equitable either. Uh, and in some of our country offices, we have it's the complete opposite. We have 70% men and 30% women. So looking at uh, that across the organization and the point you brought up about building trust was one of the foundational conversations that we had when we were revising our policies. We want people to trust the system and make it work for them. So um, I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Well, thank you for the questions. I would try to kind of answer both at the same time, more uh, giving a little bit of uh, insight of how we are operating. So in a higher level, of course, we use the political forums of the OAS to really push for that transformation and to translate what it means uh, to prioritize prevention in practice. Um, so in this higher level, either the political forums or with the ministries of uh, public security of the countries, we try to ensure that more funds are allocated to prevention components um, and assist them in using the correct indicators, uh, as you mentioned. And in a more on the ground level, we work with organizations, and then I'll give the example of the criminal justice system. Um, so as you mentioned, uh, the challenging situation of women not trusting, it's not only women, it goes beyond, but particularly for women, there are more obstacles to access to justice, to receiving a proper care. So in El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala, and that's kind of the connection of both questions, we have been working to promote access to justice to victims of crime. Um, victims of crime in the public security agenda and the multitude of problems that we have, it's often the one that is at the bottom of the priority of the agenda. So um, we are trying to bring that to light in these three countries. And to do so, the approach that we have identified that it's most effective is to try to get all those actors of the criminal justice system and also all other organizations that have, that have to participate in that comprehensive attention the victims need. So health, psychosocial services, um, uh, economic services to give them a new livelihood, bring them all together in some sort of comprehensive attention unit. Uh, that facilitates training that we can train all them in that gender perspective. We can uh, have protocols that you kind of standardize the attention that they have to give to the women and to the particularly the women in this case, uh, and to avoid re-victimization re in a sense that they don't have to go to door to door and tell their stories over and over. Um, sometimes people receive misinformation, and it's people that are usually in a very vulnerable context that that for them, it's not easy to now work one day to go to the hospital and then the other day to go to the legal aid clinic and then the other day for the psychosocial support. Um, so bring all those actors together. That's what we've been doing in those three countries. And the indicators that we use to measure success in the project, um, it's, it goes a little bit beyond just the number of women that is uh, receive attention there, but it's really measuring the levels of satisfaction, how did it improve, how does that translate in improving the reporting of crimes, of gender-based violence crimes, sexual violence crimes. Um, so see that continuum of the criminal justice system, because if we don't give attention to victims, we know that that is kind of the seed of one of the impunity, of the problems of the impunity, because people don't report the crimes. And for the um, indicators as well, uh, we do work, and we have worked in El Salvador and Honduras, doing an evaluation of citizen security systems. So we look as a whole, uh, what do we define as citizen security system is criminal justice system actors, law enforcement, uh, Ministry of Justice, Ministry of National Security, Health, Education, is that comprehensive aspect of multidimensional security. 
So we evaluate the policies of these countries. And then when we are doing this evaluation, what we look at some of the indicators is, do they have specific policies to promote gender equality? Do they have women in high level positions in those ministries? Um, do, they la do they have specific plans to address violence against women, to address sexual violence? Do they have specific legislation that criminalize those behaviors? So s those are some of the indicators that we can use in a higher level um, to, to evaluate if the countries are really prioritizing um, prevention and then as well um, the prevention of violence against women particularly. Thank you. Um, I think we want to open it for up for some more questions, but not only that, uh, Roberto, uh, who was specifically referenced as well. I don't know if you have questions or comments Actually, to I make. Question, but also to that. I, I think you need the microphone so that the people on the web uh, cast can uh, can hear you. I have two questions, um, brief. Um, so the first one is if you guys can talk a little bit about gender budgeting, because it comes down at some point to, to the budget, whether you have the resources or not to, to do the things that you that you have in mind. That's that's one element. And the second is if, what about the context of security or insecurity and how that affect women trying to engage in other type of development programs? agriculture, education, land tenure, you know, a program that allows women to get microfinance, but maybe they can go to the place where the microfinance office is because they have to go through the neighborhood walking, who knows? Like how insecurity, not the security policy, but insecurity as, a, as, a, as an item affects women who try to, you know, go to, to other type of development programs. Thank you, Roberto. Any other questions at this time? Okay. Um, so on the issue of uh, security, absolutely, it's, um, you know, one of the, I was just reading through some of the work that we've done in Asia and in Burma, um, they wanted to have actually women be a part of the we, the peace and security kind of negotiations. And so they deployed a rapid, um, def rapid response fund that allowed for childcare, for transportation, and that's one of the things we didn't formally talk about on our panel, but the unpaid care work that does fall on women and that affects them. Um, it's time that they need to be spending um, because it's part of their gender role um, on taking care of children, the household. And then we're saying, okay, why don't you do something with economic opportunity? Why don't you sit at the table with peace and negotiations? Why don't you start a little farm and what about the care work? And so we really have to make sure that we're, because that care work also contributes to economic prosperity in a given um, country. So it's not that it's not important, um, but how can we ensure that we're not increasing a double burden on women, um, ensuring their safety, ensuring their prosperity. So I think um, our programs need to look at that. And they have been kind of looking at ways of, again, engaging men, task shifting. Um, are there opportunities through some of these funds or through government um, social protection programs that specifically address child care and some of these other issues. Um, and then your other question was? Gender budgeting. Gender budgeting, yes. Um, so we have, through our policy, um, we are able to, we have standalone programming that allows us to look specifically on gender um, inclusive projects, but we actually mainstream um, budgeting through all of our projects. So it goes out through the RFP and then implementing partners will budget, um, you know, different pools of money that are specifically looking at um, gender type of work. Um, but it becomes tricky because when the mandate is to mainstream, there's two sides of it. It is harder to see, okay, and, and to, to say that because we put in $100,000 in this project, it only costs $100,000 to achieve gender equality. No. So it's really important that we nuance that and um, take a step back and say, okay, you know, if, if we're going to do an RCT and we have one project that didn't mainstream gender at all and then one that did, then we can make some comparisons. But we're really working with communities and we're working with them in a way that we want to be respectful. And so is that really appropriate to you know, include gender um, 
responsive approach and not include it elsewhere purposefully. Um, so these are existential questions we should definitely think about. <laughs> Thank you, Niati. Yeah, randomized controlled <laughs> trials are always challenging. Yes. <laughs> um, Andrea. Thank you. On the gender budgeting, this is a really interesting point because even we, so I will sit on a proposal team and I will think I'm giving all of this great inputs on gender and we come up with all of these designs and at the last minute the, the money is cut from the budget. Bef before the proposal gets gets put in and I don't find out because I wasn't in those last minute conversations to cut out things and to reduce the budget and that is such a challenging issue on a daily basis and I can tell you that I'm definitely not the only person who <laughs> who is uh, facing these so it's a constant advocacy struggle to make sure that we are keeping the money in the budget and then it gets transferred from proposal stage to implementation stage and even even at implementation stage sometimes they pull it out to to reorganize budgets. Um, and it's just a matter of advocating, advocating constantly. You have to be a diplomat and you have to be a gender advisor at the same time. <laughs> at the same, t uh, on the context of insecurity, just a comment on that. We, so we had a project in the Democratic Republic of Congo for five years to address school-related gender-based violence. And we were working in second, primary and secondary schools. And this was such a big issue of, of uh, kids getting to school and the, the um, insecurity they faced in their communities. They, f they faced um, <coughs> risks on their way to school and the way back home. In school, the levels of violence were so high that girls just stopped going to school. So in context with high levels of, of political violence that impacts uh, what's happening in different institutions, and um, it was a core component of the project to try to bring in many different stakeholders, police and parents and um, religious leaders uh, to say, you know, the students themselves have identified high levels of violence. They have told us that they don't feel safe in their own classrooms. Um, and what are we going to do about that? What is the responsibility of this community to address this so kids can continue to go to school in a safe environment? We built uh, community alliances to address the insecurity issues, the one, you know, the insecurity that they could control because a lot of it was out of their control because it was political violence going on outside or, you know, or surrounding. Um, but it's really about getting people together and saying, there's a problem here, please, you know, you can come up with a solution and empower them to do that. And uh, so we saw that to be very successful in that particular context. Okay, in um, terms of budgeting, big challenge. Uh, I think um, part of the solution may be the, the, the whole mainstreaming. So it's really not about having a gender specialist in a department uh, that is going to be the person that it will push for the funds, put the funds there, and then go to another level of review and those funds are removed. It's really about having the entire staff with that gender perspective. And then you can incorporate that budget in the whole project uh, activities and just to give an example in Jamaica women uh, the girls in the project they are 20 per 27 percent of our beneficiaries because of course the majority of the youth in conflict the law are men but almost 50 percent of our funds go to activities that benefit the girls directly so it is costly because we have a gender gap that we have to close so it's necessary to put more investment sometimes to women beneficiaries and if uh, the people that are doing the budget the proposal don't have that mindset uh, it becomes complicated because then you have those levels of review and then that's when it, it tends to get excluded uh, with uh, money for monitoring evaluation as well there is another big one that whenever they have to reduce and cut the budget usually you see that there is less money for monitoring evaluation and then it, that, that uh, generates that cycle again because you don't have data, you don't have money to have a gender analysis, you don't have money to see the results afterwards, to report in the disaggregate indicators and then you cannot really use those results 
to advocate for more funds. So um, I guess those are the two things that it's still challenges and we have to be mindful when we're doing budgets. And regarding the how women are limited, I think one of the things it's what you pointed out, uh, women are restricted in their movement because of insecurity. Um, and with that, they definitely limit their ability to go to schools, to go to jobs, to go to further training. Um, we don't right now have a specific project working on that, but all our projects in the prevention area, they try to target uh, and reduce those risk levels in the communities. It's a much bigger bigger issue because it is connected with the high levels of violence in our region and it's not going to be one project that is going to solve the problem. Uh, but in our projects we try to find innovative ways of at least minimizing the impact so the women and the girls can benefit from the intervention. So then you find innovative ways of trying to um, pay for transportation, give stipends, um, find ways that they can go together to a location, put training in hours that is during daylight so they don't have to go to the community in the nighttime. So it's little actions that at least minimize or the, the ability of the girls and the women to participate in our own interventions. But to solve the problem as a whole, we will still need to keep working together in this macro level to promote safer communities essentially in our countries. Thank you, Pierre. And, and just to add on the budgeting question, one of the things we've done at PADF as an organization is put a default line in our budget template that says mm -hmm. gender and diversity, mm -hmm. similar to That's your right. gender and social inclusion, so that if that line item is zero, it forces a conversation <laughs> about, oh, you've mainstreamed it, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and before we close, and I'm going to ask each of the uh, panelists to, 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 for some closing comments, you can do one or both of two things. One, is there anything that I or we haven't asked you that you really want to share? And two, uh, for the participants who are here in person or virtually, if there's one thing you want them to remember, what would that one thing be? And while you're thinking about that, I just wanted to share with folks, um, uh, I was in Ecuador last week and met with the Minister of the Interior, who happens to be a woman, Maria Paula Romo, and some of you are worked with her. Uh, they're putting together a, their um, um, security plan for their strategic plan. And there are two things that really struck me. It has an extremely strong gender component in terms of women's participation in this workforce, et cetera, et cetera, uh, as well as community participation. Um, uh, and two, they're having organizations like UN Women, comparable to our uh, our friends here at the Inter-American Commission on Women look at the plan and participate in elaborating it, you know, which seems to me from the policy perspective to be the right way to think about your strategic plan. So now that you've thought about how you want to answer, I will, I think we started with Andrea, so we will start with Andrea again and then Niati and then Pierre, okay. you'll get the last word. Two things I'll end with. One, the importance of a transformative gender approach to our programs. And how do we do that? We are working with women and girls. We are engaging men and boys and, and having them also understand those gender di the gender dynamics that, that govern their behaviors and their thoughts, that we are working with people of diverse gender identities and uh, sexual orientations, uh, and that we are considering the intersection of identity, disability, minority status, underrepresentation in the way that we develop our programs uh, and we engage them in a meaningful way to, in, to help us design our programs. Uh, for us, this is sort of the gold standard of how we want to see our programming being done. And I, um, you know, this is, this is what I hope that, you know, we're moving towards in that regard. Uh, that's, that's what I'll say in closing. Niyati. All right. Well, um, I like to say if you're working with people, and even if you're 
only working with animals, you're working on gender. Um, so, <laughs> so yeah, I think I'm going to echo um, what Andrea said is um, really ensure that you are checking your own biases, that you address the gaps and opportunities, and you do it in a way that's intersectional and inclusive. Um, and bring a buddy, share the knowledge. Those are the, the main things I would say. Um, but there is an opportunity to address gender in everything that we do, um, in every sector. And we're at a critical moment where there's a lot of energy. There's more awareness about what we're, what gender inequality means, what gender-based violence means, Me Too. A lot of these conversations are happening globally and there's momentum. So let's seize it and continue to move forward. And I'm really excited to see that we're talking about this now as you're getting this off the ground, um, which is the perfect time to be talking about this and looking forward to collaborating and working and supporting this going forward. Thank you, Niati. Pierre big responsibility after those words. Uh, no, just to replicate what everyone has said here. First, I think, get involved. It's, it's really refreshing to see that the majority of the audience is women, and we need more women involved in citizen security. Not to say that we don't need men that have that gender perspective, Roberto, uh, but we need more women to working in all those spheres of law, from law enforcement to criminal justice system, prosecutors, judges, um, working as correctional officers in the prison facilities, that will help a lot to change the perspective. And when you get involved, uh, keep in mind that holistic perspective and think about how women is impacted by the criminal justice system and crime and violence in different ways. From the moment they can be victims of specific crimes, gender-based violence, to crimes that take in a particular way against women, like trafficking persons, um, to the moment that they are criminalized and prosecuted, they go to prisons, um, and to that exclusion of women not finding their place in law enforcement agents and uh, criminal justice system. So I think we just need to keep in mind those different perspectives because we tend to forget some of those. We tend to not empathize with some of those. So um, whenever we get involved, just keep in mind that holistic intervention that will help a lot to mainstream gender in citizen security agenda in the region. Thank you, Pierre. So I'd like to ask everyone here to please join me in thanking our panelists, Andrea Berton, Yati Shah, and Pierre DeLuca. Big round of applause. And all of us at the Pan American Development Foundation, thank you for participating with us, with our partners at the OAS, at SIM, and USAID, and beyond. Thank you all for being here. And thank you, Roberto, for organizing. Yes. And happy International Women's Day tomorrow.